Hi, good morning, everyone. By my clock, it is 9 a.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Elaine, would you like to make some remarks to kick us off? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program known as CFAP. My name is Elaine Trevino. I'm the president of the Almond Alliance. The Almond Alliance and partnership with the Almond Board of California, USDA Farm Service Agency, and the Agricultural Marketing Service together this webinar to address the almond industry's questions about this program. I encourage you guys to all ask questions today. And while the presentation will be by Farm Service Agency, you also have AMS representatives present today. So for some quick history, everyone was impacted by COVID, especially those in essential infrastructure, including the agricultural and food service industries. As a result of COVID impacts, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security CARES Act was passed by Congress, and shortly thereafter, USDA announced the CFAP as part of its plan to provide $2.1 billion for direct payments to specialty crop producers. CFAP will provide direct support based on losses for agricultural producers where prices and market supply chains have been significantly impacted and will assist eligible producers facing additional adjustment and marketing costs resulting from lost demands and short-term oversupply caused by COVID. COVID impacted everyone in different ways, specifically commerce and goods movement. I've heard many stories from many of you as you implement new safety guidance to protect your employees, and you adjust to the impacts of the markets and commerce. It is our role to continue to advocate for programs that help the industry. And while this program is not meant to make you whole, it is intended to help your operation keep moving forward until we return to the new normal. So I look forward to hearing your questions and ensuring you receive the answers you need from FSA and AMS to administer the CFAP program. I want to thank both FSA and AMS for taking the time to be with us today and address our questions. I want to especially thank FSA State Director Connie Conway and Navdeep Dillon, the Farm Service Program's Chief, as well as AMS Charles Stevens, Associate Deputy Director, for their endless hours of putting together a program that is not only new to them, but new to you. I uh, also want to uh, say thank you to Sandra uh, Becker, who's going to be providing the presentation today. And as always, I invite you to contact me with any questions about our advocacy efforts for the almond industry. At this time, I'd like to introduce Julie Adams of the Almond Board of California to say some words um, and to let you know what's next. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Elaine. Again, we're very happy to be able to join together to put together this webinar and give you the answers that hopefully you've been looking for related to participation. Just a couple of quick housekeeping reminders as we go through this webinar. What you will see is we're going to be muting everyone who wants the speakers. And so what we would ask is that if you do have questions, you'll see on the team site the opportunity here to add a chat. And that is so that you can actually pose a question. We'll be monitoring that chat function and asking the questions as we go along. In addition, I just wanted to remind everybody we are recording this webinar so that we have all of the information available and we'll be posting it to our websites so that uh, individuals who are not able to join today will be able to see the information and follow up if there are any questions. So with that, uh, Elaine, I don't know if you have any further comments before we get into the actual presentation. At this time, I, I would just like to um, introduce the Farm Service Agency State Director, Connie Conway. Connie, could you put on your microphone and camera, please? Say a couple of words. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I did my best to be themed for this morning. So um, my work outfit today includes some blue diamonds, 
Um, and we love all our, our almond growers, but this is the best I could do. Um, and on a serious note, we appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be with you here this morning. Um, uh, complicated uh, issues um, we've been working on, and I, I have to tell you, I so appreciate the opportunity to work with uh, Elaine and Julie and uh, Bunny and everybody that made this happen. Your representatives are on top of it, and they are uh, constantly advocating for you. Um, and I just think that's important to know. Um, I'm appreciative that AMS is, is also on the call today. Um, we, uh, uh, FSA is actually the uh, issuing agent, if you will, and uh, AMS is uh, responsible for uh, the policy part of this program. Um, and uh, today, uh, the presentation we have, uh, my uh, uh, Navdeep Dillon, uh, who's my program's chief, um, had to get on another call that they expected me to be on this morning. Uh, and we love our we love our busy world, don't we? Uh, but Sandra Becker will be doing the presentation today. She's a program specialist uh, working on these programs. So uh, we're all uh, here for you today. And uh, uh, we'll certainly be available to take questions. And I'm glad that AMS is here. Uh, I'll probably defer the questions to them if there's something we can't answer. Um, but looking forward to working with all. And um, I think what the work has been done prior to this is to try and smooth the process uh, because what we want for you is that when you apply, um, it will be seamless, it will be easy, you will understand uh, the parameters that this program that really runs from January 15th through April 15th, um, how, how that's working for us currently, and um, because that's what we want. We want good rapport, we want questions answered, and we want to get you through the process as quickly and easily as we can. Okay, that was not quick, but I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, Elaine, uh, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Connie. Um, as Connie indicated, we have gathered your questions that you've asked us to date, and we've provided them to Farm Service Agency and AMS. So hopefully the PowerPoint will address um, the questions that you have asked us, specifically the pooling question uh, and how to address that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Sandra Becker, the Program Specialist of Farm Service Agency to begin the presentation. Sandra? Good morning, everyone. Um, I will go ahead and present the um, presentation that we have prepared for you on CFAP, also known as the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Next. So today's discussion, we're gonna talk about um, what is CFAP, which um, your hosts have already introduced a little bit of that. I'll get into uh, eligibility and payments and the different forms and documents that will be required and also how you will apply for the program. Next. So as previously mentioned, CFAP is, the goal of CFAP is to aid, uh, really, to provide relief for I'm sorry, the slide just disappeared. Julie, you stopped sharing your screen. <laughs> oh, come on, I'm muting. Uh, give us a moment. <laughs> Any good webinar has Um, okay, so um, as mentioned previously, the goal of the program is to provide some relief for the producers' operations that may have been impacted by COVID. However, it is not intended to make a producer whole. This program is designed to address price declines and supply chain disruptions. And it, initially, you'll receive a partial compensation, which is 80% of the computed eligible payment. And then depending on availability of funds at the end of the program, there could be an additional payment. Next. Uh, the sign up is going to run as we started on May 26th and the deadline to apply will be August 28th. And all producers need to submit any additional eligibility forms within 60 days after they submit their application. So that will vary by producer depending on when you turn in your application. 
the producers are going to apply in their local FSA office, which I'll uh, explain later how you're going to find out the contact information for your office. And this program is largely a self-certification program where the producers will self-certify to their losses and be subject possibly to spot check. And if called for a spot check, then you would be uh, required to have those documents available to prove what was certified on your application. Next. So in order to be an eligible producer, you have to have ownership risk of that identified commodity, in this case, we're talking about almonds, that suffered a 5% or greater national price loss as a result of COVID-19. And what's important to note here is that you do not need to prove that you had a 5% or greater national price loss. That has already been established that almonds fall into that category. So there's nothing additional you need to provide to support that 5% loss. Another eligibility requirement is that the applying producer has an adjusted gross income of $900,000 or less. In order to determine your average adjusted gross income for this program, we're going to be looking at the years 2016, 17, and 18. And what we'll do is we'll tally those up, divide by three, see what your average adjusted gross income is. So um, one of the forms that you'll need to complete will be certifying that you are under the $900,000. However, I want to note that it is optional that if you exceed $900,000, there is another form that you can certify that 75% or more of your income is from agriculture. And so if you, you fall into that category where 75% or more is from agriculture, then that $900,000 adjusted gross income limitation does not apply. And just a side note here that ISC DISC is included as income when you are determining whether um, the level of your income for this program. So additionally, the producers also must own a share in the risk of their covered commodity and the crop has to be subject to price risk as of January 15th. So what we mean by price risk is that as of January 15th, you were not locked in to an, a firm agreed upon price as of January 15th. It was still up in the air what the price would be. So that is what we consider price risk. Next. And I did want to know uh, also on the past slide there that it doesn't matter if you're part of a co-op or a, a pool or anything, all producers are eligible to apply for this program. There's three possible categories that you could potentially um, earn benefits on. The first one is that commodity which was sold between January 15th and April 15th. The second category is uh, almonds that were delivered but not paid. And the third category are almonds that were either unharvested and or undelivered. Now we're gonna talk about those in a little more detail. Next. So when we say sold, we mean that's a firm price agreed to on or after January 15th and on or before April 15th. The, and that the payment has either been received or a dependable expectation of payment exists. And so this includes all uses for which payment was received. Um, so it, even if you, I want to note here that if you had a firm price agreed to before April 15th and you had not received payment yet, but you had every reasonable expectation to, then we are considering that sold. Next. So the second category we have is that which is delivered but not paid. This is crop that is no longer on the farm as of April 15th. So when we say delivered, we mean it's anywhere other than on your farm. So that could be a, with the marketer in the pool, that could be to the ultimate end and, end buyer. Um, it's just not on your farm anymore. Wherever it went, we consider that delivered. And in order to fall into this category, delivered but not paid, not only have you not been paid yet, but there is no reasonable expectation of any future payment for your crop in, at any time in the future, and no matter how far down the road that is. So that's important. No. Um, with almonds, we know that th they store for quite a while 
And the likelihood is, is that they will be marketed at some point. And if that is the case, they would not be eligible for this category delivered, but not paid. Next. So the last category we have is unharvested and or undelivered. In order to qualify for the unharvested category, the crop has to be at full maturity and left on the tree or farm stored or dumped as of April 15th. And again, for this category, no reasonable expectation of uh, harvesting or selling in the future for the crop. And also another thing that would fall under this category are any donations where the recipient of the donation picks up the commodity um, and the producer does not incur shipping expenses. So we would put donations into this category. If you did donate and you incurred the cost of shipping, then that would go into the second category that we just talked about delivered and paid. One last thing I wanna note about this third category on harvested or undelivered is um, some questions that have come up with the almonds in particular are that some have um, heard that they could go ahead and put their 2020 crop uh, acres under unharvested. And that wouldn't qualify in this situation because in order to qualify for unharvested, it has to be a crop that's at full, at full maturity between January 15th and April 15th and left unharvested due to market. So therefore, the almonds are not going to be able to, to qualify for unharvested under any situation. Next. So of the three categories that we just spoke about, almonds have been approved for all three if you have a situation that fits those three categories that I just described. And here on this chart, I'm showing the payment rates for those. So the amount of almonds that you sold or had that firm agreed fixed price between January 15th and April 15th, that those would be at 26 cents per pound would be your potential benefit. And then if you had anything that was delivered but not paid and that was never going to be paid, which is going to be um, a seldom occurrence, but not not one that's that's impossible. So some of you may have had that situation. And then that's going to be paid at 57 cents. Next. So I kind of spoke about this a few minutes ago, but a couple of ineligible situations that would be any crop in storage as of April 15th that will be sold at some point in the future, regardless of price. That's that delivered but not sold category, that number two. That's what I mean by having that number two in parentheses. That's the second category. And any crop that meets this definition that will be sold at some point in the future, regardless of price, regardless of when, is not going to be eligible for delivered, not sold. And then uh, once again, any 2020 crop not yet harvested is not going to be eligible for that category number three, unharvested. This is not an all-inclusive list, of course, and if you do have some other than usual situations and you're just not sure, then we are here um, to answer those questions about your individual situations and let you know if it would be eligible and which category it would be eligible for. Next. So there, there is a notice of funding availability currently open, and that is a request for info for stakeholders and producers. This is going to close on June 2nd. So what you would do if you have questions, concerns about the rules of this program, the eligibility of the categories or the definitions or any concerns whatsoever, we do encourage you to go ahead and file your concerns at farmers.gov slash CFAP and, and do that by June 22nd so that your voice can be heard on any concerns that you may have. Next. The payments are going to be processed on a rolling basis. And so what I mean by that is it's not a first come first serve program. It is a fully funded program. 
So we do anticipate um, having plenty to get out those 80% payments to everyone who applies and who is eligible. And these are, as we mentioned in the beginning, the payments are made to offset the producer's losses, but not make whole. They don't, the payments don't come with any stipulations. Uh, we are not going to use them to offset any prior USDA debts. This is not a loan program. It does not need to be repaid. And there is no cost to apply for this program. Next. So now we're gonna talk about a few of the forms that may or may not be required to apply for the program. Now, if you have been a prior participant with FSA programs in the past, you may already have some of these forms on file and therefore would not need to uh, refile them. And when you work with your local county office, when you actually start the application process, they will let you know which one of these forms you need to file. You may not need, need them all. So one form that you all will need is the application, the AD3114. And you can get this directly from farmers.gov or by contacting um, your local county office and then they from the Then the next form we have is the member information form, the 902, which just strictly talks about your farming operation. It's a pretty easy form and they just wanna know, um, you know who, who has what shares in your operation. The next form is the adjusted gross income, uh, that form I spoke about, certifying whether or not you make $900,000 or less AGI. And then the next um, form, that 942, that's the income from farming. That's the 75% rule that I spoke about. And so if you feel that you, more than 75% of your income was from ag, then you could go ahead and file that 942 to be considered to waive that $900,000 AGI limit. And we'll just pause while we get our slides yeah. back again, sorry. Yeah, it uh, looks as though someone tried to take control of the screen, sorry. I'm not touching it. <laughs> I, I, it's very bizarre, it suddenly, it just disappeared from the, uh, the screen. So is that back now? Yep, there it is. Thank you. Okay, so um, I just mentioned the 942 form. That's the one that you're going to file if 75% or more of your income is from ag. The 1026 form is the highly rotable lands and wetland certification form. And then the next form, the customer information form, that's a one-time form just to get you into our automated system, basic information, name, address, contact information, that kind of stuff. So if you haven't participated before, that is something everybody will need. And then lastly, the direct deposit form so we can get you your payment. And so we do make all of our payments by direct deposit now. And so that's also a form that would need yeah. to be completed. There is a payment calculator on the farmers.gov website that will help to give you an idea of any potential benefits that you may have. And that's also the place where you can get an application. Next. Um, some of the form, forms and documentation you may want to have handy when you're filling, up, filling out your application. Now, these are not documents that we are going to require for you to submit along with your application, but they are documents that will help give you the information that you need in order to complete the application. There are also documents that you should um, maintain on hand in case you are ever uh, asked for a spot check. And these are just your sales records so, so that we can determine how much you sold between January 15th and April 15th. Anything that is unsold and that will never be sold. And um, really the last kind of two don't really apply to almonds unless it's a super special situation, but that would be crops delivered that are never going to be paid. And then also unharvested acres, um, which would not apply to almonds, but also in that category of unharvested, we could put those donations. So the few of you that may have donated, just keep that in mind that donations are eligible. Next. So now we're gonna take a look at the actual application 
And I know that you can't read this, <laughs> um, the teeny tiny print, but just to, so when you see the application, it won't be completely foreign to you um, as seeing it for the first time. So I'm just gonna go through real quick and let you know which parts apply to you and which parts you can just skip over. So right up at the top there, just, that's just some simple information. You're just gonna enter your state, the year 2020 and the county. Go ahead and leave that number four application number blank. That will be for the county office use. Here in part A, the first part of the application, this is kind of a little bit different than some, some of the applications and forms you might sign. These are all of your certifications right up front. Normally this would go right before your signature, but they wanted to make sure that it was up front and center. And so make sure you take the time to read these items because these are the items that you're certifying to be true when you sign this application. Next. So part B, you, uh, that's you're just gonna put in your name and address right in there. Part C and D, you can just ignore all together. That's for dairy and non-specialty crops like grains. Next. And then again here, part E and F, you can skip right over this. Um, this is for livestock and value loss crops, so that doesn't apply to almonds. Next. Here is uh, the part G. This is the part for specialty crops. And so here is the part that the almond producers will um, want to look at closer to complete. Now, you've, uh, I've, you may note here that in the circle, red circle area, this is where 99% of you are going to complete. This is just number 30 is listing the crop, which is going to be almonds, the unit of measure, which is going to be pounds or tons, and then the volume of the production that was sold from January 15th to April 15th. This is going to be the three columns that the vast majority of almond producers will complete because items 33 and 34, those are for those second and third scenarios that we went over that are going to be applicable to most of you. Next. Part H here, this is the increased payment limitations for corporations, limited liability companies, and limited partnerships. So what this section is, is if you have, if, if you fall under one of those, if you're a corporation, an LLC, or an LP, and with multiple members, and each member, has a share, then you and also contributes 400 hours of active labor or personal management per year. So that's important, 400 hours. You could list each member's name up to three in these boxes. What that would potentially do is increase your payment limitation from $250,000. This program currently has a payment maximum payment of 250,000. However, if you uh, you can put up to three names in here of members that meet that 400 hour requirement and you could conceivably possibly get an additional 250,000 for each member making your payment limitation either 500 or 750,000. So if you meet those requirements that you have multiple members with shares that contribute 400 hours or more, I do encourage you to look into whether or not you would qualify to um, increase your payment limitation on that. So that's unique to our programs. That that's probably the first time I'm aware of that happening in one of our programs. And so it's definitely something I wanted to point out to you guys. And so part I, right under that, that's just where you're going to sign and date. That's the that producer's <coughs> signature. And then the very last part of the application hey, is um, part, part J. And that's for this the county committee this? to take their action. Uh, whether or not they're going to approve or disapprove your application. So you would not complete that very last part. Next. Sandra, I was just going to ask everyone very quickly to please mute, mute your phone if you haven't done so already. I know ABC yeah. is trying to do so, but we're, we are hearing background noise. So please keep your phone muted until questioned. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about contacting the county office. What do you do next? So you can go um, onto this website here, this locator website um, that I have here, the, the web address on the first bullet, 
and that will take you right to, uh, it's a map of California, you click on your county, and then it will give you the contact information for that office. So um, that's, that's a handy resource. And then we are asking um, a preferred method of communication is if you can use that email address that is on the county locator and email your full name. If, if you're an entity, then in the name of your members, that your contact information, good current contact information, both phone and email, and the amount of production sold January 15th to April 15th. So you want to get before you email, you want you want to contact your handler and get um, that amount of production that has been sold during the time frame so that you have that number ready and um, just to streamline the process. And then once you email that information to the county office, they can they can prepare an application for you based on that information and send it back to you via email to um, to. Or if you feel comfortable with it, I would encourage you to download the application from the farmers.gov website and complete that and then um, look up the county uh, email information and then email them your application along with your uh, complete contact information. So there is um, this program has been rolled out pretty fast and there's a lot of activity. And so we find that email is just kind of the, the most um, efficient way uh, to maintain contact with producers. And also, I want to know if you have made prior contact or left a phone message or email, please be patient as these everybody who has left a phone message or an email has been noted and is on a callback list. And, and those those callbacks are being or email backs are being made, you know, on a consistent basis. So I would just say if you have already made contact, you know, give it give it a week or, or so to, to get your your call back. But we are definitely um, working as fast as possible to address everybody who has made inquiry with us. Next. So there is a central call center. There is a, an 877 number here that you can call if you have program questions or application questions. I mean, you can also definitely contact the county office, but this call center, it has been set up specifically for this program and specifically for questions. So it might be um, another resource that, that you find valuable to you. So I did want to make sure that you are aware of that number and that that resource is out there for you. Next. So just to wrap up here in conclusion, I do encourage you all to visit farmers.gov slash CFAP where there is a video of the payment calculator available um, to see how to use that. You can download the application. There's a lot of other uh, more detailed program information on there and the fact sheet, the program fact sheets. So I, I, I do definitely think they've done a really good job with this website and I would encourage all of you to visit that for more information. And then also keep in mind that that call center is there for you. You can also uh, use the call center to get the email information for your local county office if you want to go about go about it that way. And then I also take advantage of the ma the mailing and email applications and interactions. Our offices are um, currently we do have people in the office. They are currently not open to the public at this point, but uh, we all are working full time, whether in an office or from home to help you get through this program. So um, please do keep that in mind that most of our communications are going to be um, from mail and email. And then lastly, I, I do wanna just remind you again of that NOFA process. And if you have any concerns about the rules of this program or inclusion of anything in this program, I would um, suggest that you go ahead and uh, exercise your right to submit those concerns through that process. And again, you can find more information on how to do that on the farmers.gov slash CFAP. Next. And that concludes my presentation for um, CFAP. So thank you. Six. Sandra? Six. Oh, not all of us are on the computer. Uh, some of us are just listening by telephone. Could you give the call center uh, toll-free number uh, please. Sure. Can you go back to the slide? 
Okay, the call the call center number is 877-508-8382. And I do believe that this whole PowerPoint presentation will be made available. Is that right? That's correct. We uh, will be putting the presentation and recording on the websites of both the Almond Board and the Almond Alliance. Um, this is Connie, and I would just say on the call center, um, they're happy to help you. They're happy to... Uh, walk you through the process, uh, take your information and either forward it to the office that it needs to be in or walk through the application. If you have detailed questions, um, just my personal advice, you are better off calling one of our offices um, or, or even your, your Almon representatives. Uh, we've been working with them too. We wanna get your questions answered. Um, you can try the call center, but the call center is not manned by Californians <laughs> that, uh, that work with specialty crops. So um, you can certainly try it. Um, I, I would you know, suggest calling your local office first, but um, because we're limited on uh, people that we can have e inside of each office, I, I have two people answering phones, <laughs> that's it. Uh, in our offices um, because of the, the COVID. So uh, we're getting to your calls as fast as we can. Um, and certainly if you have to leave a message, it's logged um, every day. By the end of the day, it's logged and you're, you're on our callback list. And uh, people that aren't able to be in the office then are given the callback list so that they can get to it and get to you and try and help you get your application filed. Uh, it probably feels like a long process, um, a long time coming. We, we hope the process is, uh, will be simpler for you now that we, we've had this, shared this information. Um, and, and that's really just our goal to help you get through it and help you get the place that you need to be uh, and make sure your uh, questions are answered. Connie, uh, is Sandra and Elaine, maybe can I suggest, uh, we do have a number of questions Maybe Bunny can go back to the beginning of the chat and read through what some of those questions are. Sure. Yes. Okay, this sure. is Bunny. We need to go back to the application form. There are a number of questions about box 32. Yeah. And um, some of the questions include, are sales made in those months is box through, is this for sales made in those months or products shipped in those months? It would be for any pounds that were actually sold, cash, not cash, but money received January 15th through April 15th or where a firm price was agreed upon between January 15th and April 15th. The shipping date um, is, not con is not considered um, in box 32 because you have already shipped your almonds um, to the handler. And so we already consider that delivered. Where it goes from there is not part of this program. So that's taken out of the equation. So it's going to be strictly monies received during those months or where a firm price was agreed on during those months. Okay, and one person asked, where do they get that information for box 32? How do they I get believe, that? I, I believe the handlers are going to be providing that or the co-ops. Whoever markets your almonds would, would know how much you've sold. And I believe the discussion yesterday, Sandra, was also what's been contracted where you have a um, assumption of being paid for those almonds. So if it's been contracted during that period. Right. And when I say an agreed upon firm price, that that can be a contract, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a paper contract. Okay. And there are a number of questions about um, pulled almonds. I mean, yeah, pulled. So if there's a pull, what, where do pulled almonds, what category are they, are they under? So anything that was sold, um, no matter 
what channel it was sold through would during that time frame would also go under 32. Okay. And if, and the if their product, I'm sorry. That's okay. I was just going to say, and the information, um, uh, one of the beauties of this program is that it's you self certify. Um, but it's also uh, one of the stickier issues, as I can see some of the questions, you know, where do we get the information? It's from wherever you have sold, stored, if you're co-op, if you have a handler, however that works. And we will accept whatever answer you give us. Um, as I say, it's self-certifying, um, but just know that there will be random selection and some auditing going on. Uh, and uh, so you'll want to you'll want to keep a, a good record of that uh, wherever you get it from. Hold on to it um, as your confirmed number. Uh, so so we we're we're more than likely we're not going to challenge whatever you tell us. Um, you just really need to have backup records uh, somewhere so that should you be contacted, uh, you'd have that information readily available. Okay, trying to, I'm sure I'm going to miss some of these questions, but all of these questions will be, um, we'll get answers for and put them on the website. So on a, one of the earlier questions, which is not related to 32, someone asked if you received loan from the EIDL program, can you still be eligible to apply under PPP, which is different programs, but. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the answer is yes. You can apply for CFAP if you've applied for either of those other programs. Okay. Um, and then someone says, I'm an operations manager for a farming business. Can I be the principal contact for filling out CFAP application instead of the business owner? You would need to have a power of attorney, which we do also have a, a form, um, simple one sheet form that we do uh, interagency, or if you have a power of attorney established um, through a, a lawyer or something, we can take a look and see if that meets our requirements. But somebody who is not a direct part of the business with signing authority would need to have an additional document to allow that. But it is possible and it happens quite frequently. Okay. And then here's a question on part H of the um, 3114 form, form. What if you have a general partnership with multiple partners? A general partnership uh, is going to have their own payment limitations. There, That's why it's treated separately. The, on part H, it specifies the three types of entities that are eligible for that because a general partnership is already split in, if you have uh, two uh, general partners, it's already split into two different payment limitations and they would file their own separate applications. Okay. And then another question says, I am the sole member of an LLC, but my wife shares in risk and works more than 400 hours at the orchard, would we be eligible for two shares? I'm, I'm sorry, what, is she a member, did you say? She says, well, he's a sole member in an LLC, but he says his wife shares in risk and works more than 400 hours at the orchard. Would they be able, would they be eligible for two shares? So she's part part of the LLC with a zero percent, or 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 she's not part of the LLC. It's only him. If it's only him as a member, then yeah. there are no other members. Okay. Yeah, he says he's the sole member. So yeah, and there oh, are no other sorry. members. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And um, when someone asked me, find it here. Um. They're asking if this is for the 2019 crop. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. There's some feedback. Um, okay. it is, please keep it, your phones on mute. 
It will be for that crop that you harvested last fall and likely delivered last fall. And because that's going to be the crop that was subject to price risk during January 15th through April 15th. So yes, it's going to be for your 2019 almonds. Okay, but someone did ask if the 2020 crop is contracted during that time period, does it qualify? It doesn't because it's not a fully, fully, a fully mature crop. So this is only for crops that are fully mature and subject to market. And I know this is kind of a, a tough, sticky situation because yes, the 2020 crop will be impacted and, you know, things that you sold today are, you know, impacted, but yet we have this April 15th cutoff. So I very much understand the valid concern. 2020 crop. However, we have been instructed that this is this program, this CFAP program that we're dealing with today is for a very narrow period of time and it's January, uh, January 15th through April 15th. But you had the, the, the aspect of the corporation of the, the type of corporation being in the the application. I, I don't understand the question. Well, you had the application um, in the, uh, the first part of the application was at 219. And I thought that was 219, 2019 was the, the date of the uh, aspect. Can we go back to the first page of the application, please? Yeah, so program year 2020. So the program year, okay, I see how this could be con confusing. So the program year is the year of the CFAP program, which would be 2020, but it, it's it's actually the 19 crop that we're dealing with. But yes, I, I see the how that could be confusing. Thank you. There is still a lot of confusion about pulled um, crop. Um, okay. pull, so they said pulled nuts are sold at different times. I can't get a report that says exactly what was sold when. Or how do they, you know, what info do they need to get from the handler? The percentage of that pull that was sold is it just the percentage of the pool that was sold in the January through April time period? Right. So it's my understanding with the pools that, you know, it everybody part of that receives a certain percentage of that, perhaps based on the percentage, their share that was delivered into that. And so that would need to be converted into pounds somehow. Our application is... Um, is based on a unit of measure, not a, a percentage of anything. And so if they had that information as a form of percentage, they would need to be able to convert that to pounds somehow. So AMS jump in and, and help me out on that one if you, you can further. Accurate. Um, I know it's not gonna be probably an exact science, but with the uh... The pooled information um, for the application process, you have to be able to specify the number of pounds sold. So um, you're going to have to get from the handler a percentage or however they can communicate that to you. And then keep the documentation um, in the event that you're selected for an audit. And I have a fairly lengthy question here regarding box 34. Okay. It says, the quantities given by Blue Diamond for this box have a note that states, request information on acreage. Since we do not have knowledge of the specific acreage each grower has on file with FSA, we are providing you with the percentage in pounds of your 2019 crop that applies to this box. We believe that this is information we believe that that this information will assist you in determining the acreage involved with your FSA staff. Is there an extra calculation that we will need to make? 
If so, what is that calculation? Um, as uh, far as box 34 is concerned, um, you know, I, unfortunately, when, when we're uh, putting the cart in front of the horse sometimes on trying to get these programs out uh, in a really expeditious manner, sometimes there is confusion and some misinformation that uh, has been sent out. Um, everybody has been um, very eagerly trying to help their producers, completely understandable. Um, and a lot of producers were told that the, it, they could utilize box 34 for their 2020 acres that are still um, on the tree, not harvested. That is incorrect. Um, those acres are not eligible for box 34. So perhaps that's probably the easiest way to answer that question is you don't need further information on that because your 2020 unharvested acres are not eligible for box 34. Okay. And then, okay, then here's a question that's asking for clarification that members of a general partnership need to file their own separate application. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. And then someone asked, can a handler use industry average sold to arrive at a pull percent sold between January 15th through April 15th? Um, I suppose they, they could to get what their pool average was, um, but you need to break it down to that individual producer. So once again, um, and as Charles mentioned it's not an exact science and you're just going to need to, however you arrive at your figure, keep that documentation that that makes it make sense how you got to that pounds per producer. But, you know, I suppose that's one way to do it. Okay. Charles, do you have a, a response to that? Um, no, I agree. I think um, that would be one way to do it. Um, I may be oversimplifying it, but I think the probably the best way would be the pool. You know, we generally know how many, well, not we, but whoever's in the pool would know um, the pounds of almonds that went into the pool and each producer, how many they sent over there. So there should be a percentage of total. So I think that would be sufficient to substantiate your claim if, if we uh, asked for documentation for an audit after, for, after the fact. Okay, I also wanted to note that Alicia from Blue Diamond put a note in that said, if you are a Blue Diamond grower, you only need to use the information for box 32 at this time. And then someone asked about all of these questions. So I do want to let you know that we will be capturing all of these questions with answers and putting them in a document to go with the um, PowerPoint on the website. So you will have all of these answers. Okay, and then here's the question. He says, I heard yesterday that IC disc income from farming activities now qualifies not only for this program, but also the 2019 MFP payment and that late applications for those that did not file for 2019 MFP funds now can as long as they submit by June 30th. I know this is not CFAP, CFAP funds, but I suspect there are those on this meeting that would be impacted by this. I don't know if you want to. Um, yes, that's true. Uh, we had a conversation with um, some folks yesterday uh, that uh, all your representatives, I wanted to say agency representatives, but your association representatives, um, this was just come out, brought to our attention and we're trying to get it out there. Um, those, uh, that process will be handled through our state office in Sacramento uh, so that we don't get that mixed up with our CPAP, uh, CFAP programs that are happening in our 30 offices up and down the state. But yes, that is true. That's a revision that just happened and there is a window of time. Um, our Sacramento state office, uh, would be a good place to call uh, if you're interested in uh, working with that. And Mary Duger uh, will be uh, responsible for overseeing that program. Okay. 
Okay, and then someone asked, what if the 2019 crop was sold before January 15th? That that crop would not be considered subject to price risk and that amount sold would not be eligible for this program. Okay. And someone asked if you can explain in more detail what would be eligible for box 34. For almonds, what would be eligible? So that's what we've got a, I'm speaking almond specific. For box yes. 34, the uh, only situations I can think of that you would be eligible for box 34 is if somehow you are farm storing your almonds and, and, and waiting for a market or sell, um, which I think is highly unusual, but could happen. And then you were just told that, that there, uh, during January 15th to April 15th that there would be no market and for some reason you either uh, just dumped or donated them then that could that could conceivably apply or if you yeah if you just donated them but really that's that that's going to be a hard um, category for anybody to get into and, and Charles if you want to jump in on that one uh, yeah um, for for almonds um it's it's probably going to be very rare. Again, th that category is for anything that was harvested and uh, did not leave the farm or unharvested, um, which again is going to be very unlikely in in this commodity, um, and didn't leave the farm and was either destroyed or donated because there was no market for them. So there may be um, a rare case um, here or there. We would have to take those on a case by case basis. But um, those those would be the only situations for any commodity in which um, 34 would be applicable would be there. The, the commodity was left in the field, plowed under, unharvested, or it was harvested, but didn't leave the farm because um, because of the market collapse. Um, they were they were no longer needed and there was there was nowhere to send them so um those would be the only cases where 34 would be applicable okay and someone asked if they need to fill out questions 26 and 27. can you go back a slide so i can see what those were <laughs> 26 and 27 um not for almonds this is strictly for value loss crops which currently we don't have any approved but they're looking at things like aquaculture uh, to possibly include in the program but but this wouldn't apply to almonds at all okay and then someone says left on the farm doesn't mean on the tree we have product in storage at our farm but it was said if we expect to sell it at any point in the future we won't be eligible could you clarify please right sure so this this program is designed for a complete loss of market and so um or, or that reduced price during the very specified time. So if you intend to market and sell for any price at all, even an admittedly lower reduced price in the future, it's not eligible for this program because it will be sold and you will be compensated from that sale in the future. Okay. And then another question, half my almonds were sold and the other half was shipped, but not sold. There was no firm price agreed upon. Can I fill out both 32 and 33? If for that product, which was not sold, you have been told that you will not receive payment for that, as such as where the buyer just went, I don't know, bankrupt or something, or they just refused to pay. You've delivered your product, but you will never get paid for it. That's what box 33 is for. And then if a handler has unsold almonds as of April 16th, can they claim them in box 33? If they, and if they have them, well, no, because they would have the intention to sell them at some time in the future. And, and again, it, the status on April 16th, um, they're just not looking at that in this program. It's January 15th to April 15th. So no, not eligible. Okay. 
Then someone asks on for box 34, young trees that were not harvested and were, were left on and were left on the trees, would that qualify for box 34? And you know, once again, um, it's just because of the time frame, no, because the, that was unharvested during your normal harvest period, which would for 19 be during the fall of 19, which does not fall into our January 15th through April 15th window. And same reason why it wouldn't apply for 2020, because it's, it's, it's not time to harvest during this window. It has to be harvest time to qualify. Okay. And then there's a handler who's asking, what information do I need to provide our grower, both call pool and seasonal pool? I'm gonna I'm going to defer to AMS to Charles on this one, please. Help me out. Um yeah, can you repeat that question one more? Is it um for category one or for any category? It it doesn't say that. it just says he's a handler. And what information do I need to provide our grower? Both they have both call call pulls and seasonal pull. So I mean, I think for both it'd be the same thing. You um, if they were going to um, try to file a claim for category one, you would just want to provide them a letter or some sort of documentation, um, letting them know uh, how many pounds of almonds were sold from them or on their behalf um and that would be sufficient for our audit um coming back so um and then again if you got into another category like category two where they weren't going to sell it um then you, documentation explaining that we have x number of pounds for grower a and we have no intention on selling it because we're going on a business or the product the, the market was gone or or whatever so basically we're we're being relatively flexible on the documentation because we know every business and every commodity kind of has different types of forms and um and, and kind of processes but a letter or um email or some sort of invoice uh, or um you know a, a, re a, a some sort of receipt that was sent back to the to the grower um with their payment amount and for a number of pounds any 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 of those types of documents should work Charles, this is Julie. Uh, just to, to clarify, a handler could provide the grower with the percentage of uh, shipments or sales during that period, and then the grower can use that to determine, based on what they delivered to that handler, what that means in terms of pounds. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So if I'm, you know, throwing arbitrary numbers, if I if I sent a hundred pounds of almonds, and then yeah, I got a letter saying during this time I did I sold thirty percent of yours, and yeah, if if that's what you're asking, th definitely that would work. Or thirty percent of the pool was sold, and so if a grower is part of a pool, they know. That's right. Yeah, they have. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we we are just after ten o'clock. Um, I just want to be respectful of everybody's timing here uh i don't know if could that's I just, say yes yeah could i just say one one quick thing real quick because i i do want to make sure that you guys have uh the most accurate information and i apologize i did misspeak um earlier um that i realized i misspoke on something so i did want to make sure i clarify on general partnerships filing an application so it is joint ventures that would need to file separate applications, the members of joint ventures. So I did want to clarify that joint partnerships will still have their own individual payment limitations, the members in a, a general partnership, but they will, um, they can just file one application for a general partnership. So I did want to make sure that I clarified that. I apologize. Um, for misspeaking on that. So that's all I have. Okay. So um, just uh, quickly, just a reminder, we will be putting a copy of the presentation, uh, the recording and summarizing a number of the questions that have been asked and put that together on the Almond Board and Almond Alliance websites. Uh, I'd like to thank FSA and AMS for all of the information today. Elaine, do you have some closing remarks? 
I would also like to thank Farm Service Agency and AMS. And if if anyone has a question that wasn't answered today, um, the uh, you can uh, either call the numbers on the screen here. For those of you that are not um, on a webinar or you don't have a screen and you only have your phone, you can call the Almond Board and or the Almond Alliance um, and ask your questions. We'll make sure to get them responded to from Farm Service Agency. But I think the FAQ um, will be pretty comprehensive and we should get that out to the industry shortly. And for those of you that have concern about the 2020 crop, just know that we um, are working on that and it's kind of a separate project, but it's on our radar. So with that, I just want to thank everybody and uh, encourage as many people to apply. I think it's a great program and hopefully will be beneficial to you uh, to get through this tough time. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us.